Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here for our a &R seminar series and today's presenter, Dr. Bob Nielsen. For those of you who don't know, I'm Greg Bazaar, Assistant Program Leader in Ag and Natural Resources, and I have the great pleasure to get to introduce Bob. Uh, many of you know Bob grew up a corn husker, so naturally at a young age he find, you know, started loving corn. And uh, that love nurtured him into an extension specialist that started here at Purdue and is still here at Purdue, started in 1982. Um, Bob was always an early adopter. I don't think he invented the internet, but uh, <laughs> he did quickly start using it. His chat and chew, King Corn, or um, two websites that are used not only here in the United States but internationally. And Bob's probably one extension specialist that I can say every corn farmer probably knows because they've probably been to one of his presentations or he's been on their farm walking cornfields or he's been on their farm doing on-farm research. For extension educators in the field he has been just a tremendous resource. Um, I had the pleasure to work with him for 30 years, and he was also extremely helpful and helped me to become a better extension educator. So I'm going to let Bob take over now, but uh, again, help me welcome Bob Nielsen. Thank you, Greg, for giving my seminar. So when Greg asked me to do this uh, sort of reflection over my career, I, I, I didn't know what really to make of it, and I didn't know if this was some encouragement that I ought to retire, or, and, and at the time I didn't know about the incentive packages that were going to be coming down, and, and, but, and, and it appears that this title has created some fear-mongering, ru rumor-mongering, I should say, um, around the campus about whether I am, in fact, planning to retire soon or not. And, and I, I don't know how many times I've heard it over the past few days. And so, you know, you see my Twitter account. And so this morning I put out a Twitter to, a tweet to try and put a, a stop to that, if this works. Uh, just, you know. <clears throat> <laughs> the one thing I have learned from President Trump is the power of capital letters, so. I, I'm going to adopt my tweets from now on to make sure I have plenty of capital letters in it. But uh, be assured, I'm, I, I'm not going to be retiring in the near future that I know of it. Greg indicated that I was born and raised in Nebraska, um, out on the prairies. Um, there's some that, that look at my white beard and figure I must have been born in a sod house, but that isn't true. That's another... Um, uh, piece of fake news, um, but I was born and raised on a small farm in Nebraska, cash grain, uh, a few animals just mostly to keep ourselves in, in, in meat and eggs and, and milk, but mostly a, a cash grain farm, and I received a, a good education at the University of Nebraska with a focus in agronomy. Um, Ken, you'll remember this photo uh, when we went out for the first ever Purdue game at Nebraska in the Big Ten. Oh, hold it, excuse me here. Um, just pay no attention to. Uh, okay, there you go. Uh, sorry for that uh, misspelling. Um, but it does remind me to remind you that the, the big red ends on the stadium just don't stand for Nebraska, but they also stand for knowledge, so. <laughs> So after Nebraska, uh, moved to Minnesota, uh, Suzanne and I did, went to grad school, and I actually studied plant breeding and genetics uh, there, and really didn't think about extension at all during most of that career. And so it, it, you know, whenever I share this with people, they seem to think it's a bit odd that I ended up in extension, but towards the end of graduate school, as I started looking at plant breeding positions around the country, there were also a few extension positions open and um, one was here, one was Illinois, one was at Wisconsin. And uh, there, the, the, the proverbial light bulb did come on. There was just something about those job descriptions that sort of struck a chord with me. One of my, uh, one of my professors that I TA'd for 
while I was at Minnesota was the extension corn guy at Minnesota. And so I asked him about extension and, and whether he thought that would be a good career for me or not. And he encouraged me and a few others did to take a look at these positions. And so among the places I came was this place called Purdue that I really didn't know much about. And, and you know, I say that it was some Ivy League private school. One of my uncles really did think that's what Purdue was when I first told him I got this job. And interestingly, it was a small grains extension position. Uh, Kim Palazzato had retired or had left. And so this was the position I interviewed for and was the, the position I got. And then before I arrived, uh, the corn, previous corn guy at Purdue decided to leave to go work for the Potash and Phosphate Institute. And so Dr. Mar Phillips, who was department head at the time, uh, either by letter or, or phone, you know, asked me if I wanted to consider switching to corn. Well, that took about all of two seconds, and so the rest is history, as they say. And, and so I arrived at Purdue uh, as the extension corn specialist for the state. Uh, back in the day, the prairie farmer would always uh, print uh, a picture, a photo gallery of all the field crops extension people. So this is what we look like in 1983 in the Prairie Farmer magazine. And so these are a number of my colleagues and mentors that I began my career with. Uh, some of them are, are here today. Uh, Dave Mingle at the time was sole fertility specialist. Uh, he eventually went out to Kansas State to be department head and and, uh, and, and so he was a sole fertility person. Uh, Keith Johnson, of course, uh, did his graduate work here and stayed on. And he's also from Nebraska. Um, Marv Swearingen was the soybean uh, uh, person at the time. Bill Treese was, was our uh, Vincennes uh, connection. And he taught the courses at Vincennes and was also extension for that area of the state. Don Griffith is here with his hand up there. Uh, Don was, was primarily a tillage guy who worked very closely with Jerry Mannering. Uh, and then, of course, Steinhardt was here at the time. And, and Gary, I'll always remember one of the first quotes or Steinyisms you shared with me about getting through the promotion system. You said, it doesn't matter if you're a hero of the people out in the state or not, you need the coonskins on the wall here to get promoted. And, and so, uh, and then Cliff Spees, who wasn't able to join us today, was also a soil fertility uh, person. And then in the botany plant path department, we had people like Don Scott, Tom Jordan, Tom Bauman, Gail Rule, I saw you, Gail Rule at the, was here, Merrill Ross, who recently passed away. Um, and, then, and then entomology at the time, the primary extension uh, person for, for corn was Rich Edwards. And then, of course, Dave Matthews and, and John Ferris and Gary Walker. And, it, and I don't know why we didn't publish other extension people at Purdue and the Prairie Farmer, but certainly all the folks in ag econ, all the folks in ag engineering uh, uh, that dealt with the field crops. The only point I make with this is I came in as a young specialist and I had all these icons there sort of waiting. And, and, and not, just, not just there, but willing to share their knowledge, willing to share their experience to help this youngster coming in from, from graduate school to get his feet on the ground. Um, I inherited some of my, uh, I guess, straight talk from Mengel. I inherited my curmudgeonly uh, outlook from Swearingen. Um, I inherited my love of people from Bill Treese. Uh, and I guess I inherited my good looks from Keith. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, you know, you, you emulate a lot of what you see, the, the, the good specialists that you're around and the good teachers you're around. There's just, you pick out bits and pieces of everything they do. And so I, I look at all these people and I just see bits and pieces of what I do today in extension. And, and so it's, um, and I'm not sure that, that I've been as good of a mentor and colleague as these people were to me, uh, to the youngsters that are coming in uh, today. But so when I began in 1982, um, I didn't really have a good view of the future. Uh, I wasn't really sure that I knew what was coming along in ag technologies or in technologies in general. And so back then, some of the things I could not imagine that did happen, I couldn't imagine that we would ever document corn yields as high as 400 bushels an acre. We had done it at 300 bushels an acre with Herman Warsaw in Illinois, I believe, in the late 70s. But I couldn't imagine 400 bushel. And then in 2001, Francis Charles in Iowa documented the first uh, 400 bushel or more yield. And that was just pretty cool stuff. Um, I couldn't imagine global positioning systems. I couldn't even spell the word, uh, let alone understand what it did. 
Uh, certainly didn't really understand or even predict anything about precision ag technologies in 1982, Howard, right? We just weren't really into that kind of stuff yet. I had no idea about transgenic crops. I knew about genetic engineering from graduate school. And, and back then we always joked about the fact that, that the benefits of, of, of molecular engineering, genetic engineering were always just around the corner. And it didn't matter if it was in 1970 or 1980 or 1990, it was always just around the corner. And then eventually we got transgenic crops that changed so much of, of what we do. I certainly couldn't under, imagine the internet or email or this web thing. I, I had no clue of this in 1982. And cellular phones for crying out loud. The first example or first opportunity for me to use cell phones in extension uh, was on a trip actually into Northwest Ohio with Dave Voris of Voris Seeds. And Dave had a cellular phone, it was a big, a big, uh, what do you call it, lunch pail type size one. And we were, in a, we were in a field of corn and we were looking at some problems with roots. And I was pretty sure it was rootworm, but I was sort of dumb and naive. I didn't know a rootworm from a corn bore at that point in time. But, but, and I thought, man, if I could just get a hold of Rich Edwards. And Dave Vohr says, oh, I've got this cell phone in the truck. I said, what do you mean cell phone? And he says, no, I got a cell phone. You could call back to Purdue from this cornfield. And I said, you've got to be out of here. And so we went back and I called Rich Edwards from this cornfield in Ohio. I got the answer to what I wanted, gave it to the farmer, and off we went. But think about this, right? Cell phones, the opportunity at that point in time to call from a cornfield and get an answer for an extension clientele. I mean, this is revolutionary. And then, of course, the rest is history on that, too, as they say. Um, text messaging, for crying out loud, you could imagine that. Twitter, Facebook, it didn't mean anything. Couldn't imagine the Crop Diagnostic Center, even though its origin was only a few years into that future, but I couldn't imagine that. Uh, personal computers, Charlie, I remember, where are you at, Charlie? I remember when Jerry Cherney lobbied to get the first personal computer to put in his lab. And, and it, was, it was like a cardinal sin. This thing, these were never going to work. It'd never do anything that the huge you know, bank of computers would do. And, you know, and I remember he had to fight tooth and nail to get a personal computer back in the mid 80s, or early 80s, somewhere in there. But it, so I couldn't imagine having my own PC and then let alone thinking about a laptop or an iPad or anything else. Um, PowerPoint presentations. I finished this. I finished tweaking today's presentation about half an hour ago. Well, my gosh, you know, back in the days of slide projectors, you had to have your presentations done one or two weeks ahead of time so you could give them to Bob Hutchinson in agronomy so he could burn them on the diazo slides that then you would put into your carousel to use with your slide projector. And because it was such a painful thing to do this, you were stuck with that slide set for the whole winter. And now we tweak them up to the very last second. And so I, I couldn't imagine anything like PowerPoint back then. I couldn't imagine LCD projectors. And I certainly couldn't imagine digital cameras. I mean, I thought it was pretty cool that I inherited a pretty decent SLR camera from my predecessor. Man, I could do some really slick slides with those because it took really good pictures, or at least I thought so in the day. So I certainly couldn't imagine nice digital SLRs, let alone smartphones, iPads with cameras that are, what, 20 times better than we could ever get out of those old SLRs. Um, and I couldn't imagine corn yields higher than 500 bushel which was achieved in 2014 by Randy Dowdy down in Georgia and followed in short order by David Hula in Virginia in the National Corn Yield Contest. I certainly couldn't imagine that in 1982. So I guess the point I want to make from this is I got no vision. Right? I, I couldn't see the future. I've just adapted and evolved as we've gone along and tried to take advantage of some of these. I will say that I tend to be an idealist and so I really lean on the spirit of the original Smith-Lever Act that created the extension organization in this country uh, to sort of guide my philosophies and principles. And sometimes it's interesting to go back and read these old works like this. And so when you look at the language of the original act, and it talks about the fact that extension work will consist of the development of practical applications and the giving of instruction and practical demonstrations to people not attending or resident in said colleges and to impart information on these said subjects through this and that and the other thing, right? This is pretty much what we still do today in extension, right? It's, it's more fancy and it's more futuristic and it's really high tech. But by and large, this to me is still the essence of extension that was set up in, in 1914. So in my mind, extension is about service. 
It's not about personal fame or glory. It's not about university recognition or reputation. It's about service to our clientele. And I think this has got to be the underlying philosophy and principle to be successful in extension. Uh, Sean, led me, uh, Sean Castile led me to this uh, book by Bruce Lansdale called Cultivating Inspired Leaders. And there's this one phrase in there that just strikes me that as he's talking about service organizations, he says, the failure of many service organizations is that managers spend too much time striving to enhance their reputation or that of their organization rather than serving their clients. And I fear that sometimes we get into that mold that we feel we have to be promoting ourselves and we have to be you know, trying to establish that fame and glory and reputation, partly to bring in money and, and partly to maybe uh, defend what we do in, in the, in, you know, in when we're competing with other interests. But I think if we fail to remember that we're here to serve people in extension, uh, that's what gets us into trouble. And so I, I try to remember this, or it really drives a lot of what I do. So this service part of extension includes listening to our clients, listening to their problems, and maybe most importantly, holding conversations with them at their level and not from on top of the ivory tower. And too often I've, I've been at conferences and other places and listened to experts on the program and they're just sort of pontificating uh, from their lofty tower and they know everything more than you do and, and they really never get it down to your level. And I guess, if anything, I've always been very simple and, and very uh, common and, frankly, I guess pretty dumb. And that's why you can understand me, okay? Because I, I, I try to, to talk at, at your level. And, and, and part of this service involves addressing relevant problems with relevant research to develop relevant answers. And if we're not doing this, then again, we're not providing service. And then, of course, once we do all that, uh, we need to disseminate these results to our clientele. And Gary, you're so full of good quotes. Uh, the other day as we were walking back from, I think, the department head seminar, and you shared this with me, and I, I just felt I had to put it in here, that Gary reminded me that so often what we do in extension is we're providing knowledge to people who don't know they need it. And, and sometimes it's easy to forget that. And, and, and so they come to our meetings because they need continuing education credits to maintain their, their pesticide applicator's license. And they come kicking and screaming because that's what they're there for. And then, oh, by golly, they learn a few things or something, right? They didn't really know they needed it. And, and, and yet this is so much of what we do in extension is we're, we're generating and providing knowledge to people who really don't know that they need it. So thank you for reminding me of that, Gary. Take a look at this. And we, we, we joke about the internet and how you can't believe what you read on it, but, but I, this is actually a pretty valid quote, I think. <clears throat> And it pertains to what we do in extension because we have had the responsibility to address alternative facts for decades. This is a big part of what we do in extension that is not about the research per se, it's not about the teaching per se, it's about addressing alternative facts with our clientele and helping them improve their critical thinking skills and decision making. And, and and have we not heard this from President Daniels over the course of the last year or so about the need here on campus to do a better job of teaching critical thinking to our students? We face the same challenge with our clientele out in the state. We, we filter the Kool-Aid before they drink it, okay? We help them sort the wheat from the chaff. We just help them distinguish fact from crap because there's so much crap out there uh, that is not based on sound research, that's purely marketing claims, uh, and in a lot of degrees has really nothing to do with what we had and really intended to talk to our clientele about, but it's clear as you work with these audiences, it's very clear sometimes that they simply don't have the skill set or the experience to figure out how do you sort the fact from the crap? How do you sort the wheat from the chaff? And so a lot of what we do in extension is trying to help them understand what's valid research, what's valid data, what are valid conclusions on, on things. I, I was gonna throw this in this morning and I'll just throw it out quick and, and without bashing any one company too bad, but, but there was an article in the recent Prairie Farmer about twin row corn production. We've chatted about this before, Dan. Twin row corn production uh, and it's being promoted by one seed company that also promotes using their varieties planted at about twice the population that you would and, and somehow this comes together and it's a miracle. So there's an article in the recent Prairie Farmer about some farmers experience about twin row corn and, and, in, and he really doesn't say much about 
it really isn't much detail until you get to this one little paragraph that says that in comparisons with 30 inch rows, he has increased yields 50 bushel. Do you believe that, Dan? And then the second paragraph says, every time he's compared it, it's increased 30 to 50 bushel. Well, from a critical thinking perspective, there's hardly anything we do in extension, or any, any, there's hardly any production practice we're gonna recommend to anybody that's going to increase yields 30 to 50 bushel. So right off the bat, anybody reading this article should question that article right off the bat because it is so outrageous that, that you just gotta think twice. And yet I'm not sure our clientele always have that ability to do that. So uh, I, frankly, in the last 10 years, I probably have spent more time than ever on my presentations around the state addressing these kinds of issues that I just don't remember doing, say, 30 years ago. So it's become a real, real issue uh, for us. Sometimes uh, the manure hits the fan for our growers in terms of weather problems. And we were talking about this at the beginning, Dan, what's gonna happen this summer given what we've seen this winter, or unusual pest outbreaks, or just simple economics. This winter, Jim Mintert, Michael Langemeyer, and I and Sean have been going around the state doing more, pro more meetings dealing with the economic situation and helping people figure out how to cut costs or, or simply improve the contribution margins. And, and so a lot of what we do in extension service is sort of above and beyond teaching the fundamentals of agronomy or, or entomology or anything else. It's about responding or helping growers respond to, to calamitous agricultural situations. Um, and ironically, it's those situations where the manure hits the fan and you have part of a state or the whole state affected by some calamity that's shaping up. Ironically, that's when extension really pulls together. And ironically, that's where the teamwork really comes together. And frankly, in a morbid sense, those are some of the most fun, fun memories that I have are, are how we responded to some of these issues that hit the state. So this is Indiana corn yields from 1956 through last year. Uh, yields are increasing just under two bushels per acre per year. And I've highlighted some of these years where the manure has hit the fan in terms of weather. We've had one, two, three, four major droughts uh, beginning in 1983. Uh, we had in 1992, uh, those of you that remember Agronomy Farm Field Day, it was 95 degrees or 98 degrees or something, and then two days later, we had a killing freeze. First day of summer, First day of summer in 1992, followed by the rest of the summer being a relatively cool summer. In 2009, we had a god-awful late wet harvest with a lot of moldy grain, a lot of mycotoxin issues. Yield statewide ended up being pretty good statewide, but the quality of the grain was horrible. And all of these represent the, the kind of, of calamities that drew extension together and, and into some wonderful teamwork uh, to address these problems and help our clientele around the state. And again, this is above and beyond what you and I teach people during the winter. Right, this is above and beyond what we do in a normal kind of sense. Now I do find it somewhat uh, interesting that when I came, after I came in 1982, it's, it's actually a little, a little depressing how many of these years we've had. Um, and actually in the first summer, 1983, was my first full summer here and, and apparently I decreased yields 53 bushel an acre from the year before. So, you know, I, I do worry about that, but, but nevertheless. So, let me just share a little bit of, of extension education as I do it. Uh, this is a photo from, from the drought of 1988. Uh, that's me showing a, a, a group of farmers who are totally enthralled with what I'm <laughs> apparently showing them. Um, and, show, and, and what I've got on my finger is a wee bit of a little ear of corn that's, that's immature and, and I guess I'm telling them, you know, have hope, have faith that, you know, the drought's gonna break. Uh, they just weren't really paying too much attention. This is this rapt attention has is pretty much not changed till today. Uh, this is still pretty much what we deal with when we're out on some of these meetings. Um, but these are some of the the core things that I have in my mind as I do my extension education. I teach the fundamentals. Um, I try to conduct sound, relevant research to address issues that are meaningful, and then from that develop or promote the guidelines uh, from that research for growers. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations by phone, by email, by text messaging, which in and of itself is a form of education. And then of course I publish a lot of timely advice and observations, mostly online today, and in the old days it was hard copy uh, newsletters that would come out. 
But this is sort of the core of, the, of what I do in extension. It's not fancy. It, it's not really high powered, uh, but it, it addresses the issues that are out there. Some of the tools in my toolbox uh, can be lumped into two categories, tools that are direct contacts and tools that are indirect. And so the, the tools that represent direct contact are, are those face-to-face -face kind of opportunities. So the one-on-one -on -one visits to a farm field, uh, the, the county programs, uh, most of which today are for continuing education credits for uh, pesticide applicator license, and these, these are the ones that are coming, kicking and screaming to the meeting, and then you just hope you make an impact on them. Uh, regional programs that may be multi-county based, statewide programs like the Crop Diagnostic Training Center, uh, multi-state programs uh, of, of various shapes and kinds. Uh, I do a, a fair amount of travel out of state, not, not a whole lot, but I do some out of state extension work. And then national programs, and, and some of the best examples of that would be the Farm Progress Show years ago, or when we used to have that here. Uh, but this just sort of represents the kind of programs that I've had over the years. Um, and it does take a lot of road time, but it's just one of the necessary evils of, of, of doing it, in my opinion. Some of the indirect contact tools that I, I use include the news media, and today increasingly that's more online than anything else. Uh, traditional extension publications, uh, YouTube videos, and Obi's not here today, but John Obermeyer's been the one that has uh, sort of persuaded us to do some of these YouTube videos. And then Greg mentioned my King Corn web uh, site, and, and so there's a lot of resources there that I've developed over the years. And then recently, I, in terms of social media, I have begun to use Twitter. I started it maybe two or three years ago, gave up on it, quit, came back to it, because someone shamed me into it as some former colleague up, who's now in Wisconsin. And I went back into it. I really don't understand the attraction of it, but I've got 2,600 followers, and they seem to like what I put out. And, and I, but I struggle with the impact. These are the Twitter impression metrics. Now, impressions, as I understand it from Twitter, are simply how many times did it show up in your Twitter account or, or in anyone's Twitter account. And, and so this is an example of, of something I'd put out. Uh, Jim Cambrado and I just uh, revamped our plant population set of guidelines. And so when we got that put on the web, I just sent out that little tweet. Um, and, and, that's, and that's generally the kind of thing that I'm sending out is, is stuff that is more information than, say, cutesy kind of tweets. Uh, these are the monthly impressions. And for last year, I had over half a million impressions off my Twitter account. I don't have a clue what that means. <laughs> Meaning, I don't know if this is impact or not. I don't know if it's a meaningful education tool or not, but I've got 2,600 followers and, 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 and it wasn't just those 2,600 that saw my tweets, there's a half a million. And this engagement rate of 3.9%, as I understand it, is, is the percent of the time that people actually engaged with the tweet. So this, if they clicked on that and went to my link, that's an engagement. If I have a photo of some problem in a cornfield and they clicked on it to bring it up, that's, I guess, engagement. So out of that 560,000 impressions, I had roughly 21,000 engagements. Well, that's probably more meaningful than the impressions, but I still don't know what impact those engagements have. So I struggle with social media. Apparently, it's of some use, but I wish we could figure out a way to document the real impact of it. But I'm of a mind that these are 2,600 people that I may not otherwise reach, or at least some portion of them I don't otherwise reach. And so it's, again, another tool to couple with my web stuff, to couple with my extension programs out in the state. It's just another tool to reach more people, but again, I tend to sort of struggle with it. So I want to give you just a couple of examples of some of the successful programs I've been involved with uh, in my career. And I found this on the web, which I think is a, a cute little illustration of, of success that, you know, some people think that success is just a straight line progression to get to your success when it's really just a whole mishmash of of, of attempts and trials and errors and everything else to get there. And that, that does describe a lot of what we do in extension. I wish Rich Edwards had been here today, um, but one of the, probably the best success stories I've had is the Crop Diagnostic Training and Research Center. And yes, I was one of the founding fathers. Um, I am, uh, I'm not the only one left alive, but I am, I am one of the founding fathers and so in December of 1984, Marlon Bergman from Entomology 
uh, who was, we came in together in 1982, so he was the same age I was, uh, Tommy Jordan from Weed Science, Don Scott from Plant Pathology and myself, we put together this white paper for Purdue's administration, uh, a proposal to develop and implement a field training program for problem solving in agricultural production. I won't say this was a vision of mine uh, because I think Rich Edwards and Don Scott and Tom Jordan had been thinking about this for a while and they sort of drug me and Marlon Bergman into it because we are the youngsters and so they thought well this would be good for you maybe to get involved with this and so I ran it past our department head uh, Marv Phillips and I showed him this proposal I had him read it I said Marv this sounds pretty interesting to me and he read through it carefully and he says Bob he says I don't know that you really got, you really shouldn't get involved with this. He says, you know, this is a team kind of thing, and as a young professor, you're not going to get a lot of credit for this in promotion. He says, I don't think you really ought to do it. And I left his office with my head down and then promptly went ahead and, and just worked with these guys and made it happen. Um, and it turned out to be one of the best things I ever did in my young career. But I just find it ironic that Marv was convinced I would never get enough credit out of it to satisfy me from promotion and tenure. So once I got into it, it became sort of a vision, but, but certainly I don't take credit for the vision itself. But now it's from these, what I say, uncertain and humble beginnings, Corey. Uh, this has become the premier, are we safe to say, the premier hands-on training facility in, in the country. We've had a lot of people imitate us around the country since we, we started this. And so now we're in our 1985, six being the first year, we're into our 30, 30 some years of, of it. Uh, and so we do a lot of, of training in the field and we train what a thousand people a year maybe in the trio with how many average workshops 20 or 30 uh, workshops a year we've got a number of publications that have been tremendously successful especially the first one the corn and soybean field guide uh, depending on the year we'll, we'll sell from 5,000 to 10,000 up to 40,000 50,000 of, of these a year and then we came out with, with the wheat guide, forage guide, cover crop guide. We have an iPad app. We're how close to getting the, uh, the smartphone apps out? <laughs> We're really close to getting the smartphone apps out for these things, so keep an eye on that, Dan. Uh, but this has been among the, essentially, the single most uh, successful thing I've been involved with. And it's been a total team effort. I think that's the point I want to make is that you know, we, we talk so much about team efforts and how important they are, and clearly this is an example of not just a, a team effort per se, but a multi-departmental team effort uh, that has been very successful and, and continues to go strong. So I indicated uh, a little earlier that I'm not very good at visioning, and, and that the Diagnostic Center really wasn't my vision. I came along for the ride, really. And so I've only had, in my experience, I've only had one example of a true vision as an extension specialist here at Purdue. And it began with a radar image. So back in about 1993, 94, uh, some of you remember Terry Semmel. He was the first director of the Crop Diagnostic Training Center. And he, he came out of, of an entomology mindset, and so he had a, a, one of these damn Apple Macintosh computers that nobody really understood. That, that's neither here nor there. Uh, but but and he was a couple offices down from me in Lily Hall. And one day he came down to my office, says, Bob, Bob, he says, you got to come down and take a look at this. And so I walked down to his office and looked on his Mac computer. And he had, and he had this thing on, a, on the computer display, something called Netscape. It was something called a browser. And he was connected to something called the web, the, the World Wide Web. And there's this radar image on his computer. And, and, and as I looked at the lower corner at the, at the timestamp, this radar image was only an hour old. Can you imagine a radar image at your desktop on the display that was only an hour old, coming off this, whatever this internet stuff was? The only true vision I had, I said, I gotta get in on this. There's an opportunity here to develop something of, and use it as a communication medium and do something really cool with this. Well, none of my clientele were on it yet. And it's like, oh crap. <laughs> and so I rushed down to Ag Communications, and I hope I don't insult anybody here, but I went down to Ag Communications, and I said, man, I've just seen this example of the World Wide Web, I gotta get into this, how do I do it, and, and what's it gonna cost? And, and they said, oh yeah, you can get into it. And they said, oh, it's only gonna cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars to do it. And I said, oh, geez, Louise. 
And so I was moping back to Lily Hall from Ag Administration. And I don't know, I happened to stop by uh, Whistler, where entomology used to be back in the day. And I may have gone up to Obermeyer's office, but I, or not, I forget why it just sort of ran through that. And I ran into their computer people, Terry McCain, Carl Geiger, who were entomology's IT people back in the day. And entomology had begun to do some web stuff. And Carl and Terry McCain were involved with it. And I came moping back and I told them my story about ag communication saying it's going to take a couple hundred thousand dollars to do all this. And I can still remember Terry McCain saying, no, 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 no. This is easy stuff. This coding is easy. We'll teach you how to use this HTML coding, this HTML crap, whatever that was. We'll teach you how to do that. And we'll give you space on our internet server here in entomology to put your first website on. All right, And so the rest, again, as they say, is history. And so I created what I called initially just the Corn Growers Guidebook, and at some point it morphed into King Corn. But it was the Corn Growers Guidebook with the intent that this was going to be the compilation of all compilations of corn information from not just Purdue, but from all over the country, because this was the vision of the web. We can now offer not just what we have at Purdue, but we could gather and aggregate and provide information to growers from all over the country. And so the guidebook came into being, eventually morphing into King Corn. The Chat and Chew Cafe came along in short order as simply a, you know, it's a cutesy name and it was from the get-go, but the whole intent was this is where you can get your, your gossip and your, 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 your timely articles and this and that. And so in the College of Ag's 1995-96 uh, annual report, um, and I launched this in 1995, and then in the next annual report, uh, the school did a big sort of expose on everything we were doing in the School of Ag on the internet and the web. And, and the, the guys in animal science uh, had the pork page already up and going, I think by then, right Wayne? Right. And, and so there's this article back in there uh, that highlighted it, and of course, None of us really knew if this was really going to fly at that point in time, I don't think. It was really cool stuff, but again, few of our clientele were on board. And my thought was, I don't care if they're on board yet. I'm going to get this thing built and make it available so that when you did get internet connection, Dan, it would be there waiting. The only true vision I've ever had, uh, but, but one that has been uh, fairly successful. In the last five years, uh, the Chat and Chew Cafe itself has had over half a million page views. The rest of the King Corn website has had over a million page views in the last five years. I don't know how this compares to other ag pages at universities around the, the country, but I think it's up there with quite a few of them. And it's been a very, very successful way to get information out and to house it and compile it and catalog it in a way that, that, that makes it useful to people. And, and it's just been a, a, a very successful uh, thing for me that, that I've been really proud of. Um, got involved with Precision Ag back in the late 90s. Uh, this began over at the Davis Purdue farm and with the likes of Chris Johansson who was uh, remote sensing and was playing around with satellite imagery over at the Davis farm. Um, and then that sort of morphed into eventually when we did the order one soil surveys on that south 120 acres uh, that we used some of Chris's satellite imagery as well as aerial imagery as well as just a, a lot of GPS technologies. Um, and then during those year, early years, we were also doing a lot with these yield monitors, and that was mostly Sam Parsons out of Ag Engineering leading that charge. But we're just trying to figure out, are these things really accurate? Or you know, what, 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 is, what, what can go wrong? What this and that? And so it was just, again, another team effort that sort of circled around this precision ag area uh, that, that was being led by various and, and sundry people. And for me, the exposure and experience that I gained with those technologies beginning in the late 90s eventually became really valuable to my field research as well as for my extension program relative to my credibility with my clientele. Because one of the things about extension that you, know, you, you, can, you can give them book knowledge, but if you can give them real experience to go along with it, they'll listen to you and your credibility goes up. And so that has become really valuable to me to understand these precision ag technologies when I'm out with my clientele dealing with these things because they know that I know, well, I won't say I know totally what I'm talking about, but I can sure bluff them pretty good uh, with what I do know. Um, one example that I, I just felt I had to, to show was what we did with this technology for the 2001 Farm Progress Show when, in Tippecanoe County. We created a corn maze 
with the technology. And this was a team effort that, from the best I could count up, there were close to 25 of us involved with this project. It began with Sharon Katz in Ag Communications. Are you here by chance? Because I sent her a, a request to come. Sharon Katz drew the design for the corn maze. So what you see there is, is from Sharon Katz's uh, computer. She drew that. One of Chris Johansson's students converted that to a geo-referenced GPS layer, GIS layer. And then, as I say, a crack precision team assembled to pull this off with the technologies and frankly cold hard steel. And so, and again, this in, with what we know about the technologies today, this is not whiz-bang stuff. But back in the day, this was pretty novel use of the technologies. We planted the field, that's not novel, except that we planted it two directions to make sure it was thick enough to eventually cut out for a corn maze. We had old backpack GPS units and very, very tiny palm top uh, uh, mobile platforms with the, the, GI, the mapping programs in it. And so then we had the, the map that had been converted uh, from, the, from the maze design. And what we're doing here is when the corn was, had barely begun to come up, we were simply going through that cornfield with that map and these heavy uh, backpack GPS units and the really hard to see platforms and just following these trails through the field and someone was spray painting the trail behind us. And then we'd get to a, joint, uh, to a corner and we'd put in these, these uh, markers, these garden markers with arrows saying, okay, you're gonna go this way, you're gonna go that way. That took us a full day with probably oh, 15 or 20 people. Were you involved with that, Suzanne? Uh, I was out there, a bit, just one, I didn't help the whole one. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, yeah, so you were part of the, of the other team then that, Brandon did a lot of that yeah, so when the corn's about knee high, you could still see the roadmark paint of the design on the field. And so we had, and so we had teams with, the, with these industrial sized mowers, and you can barely make out the roadmark paint right there in front of, of where he's mowed. And so we just took those mowers in and we were following this trail that we had marked with the GPS, you know, a couple weeks earlier. So to, to sort of cut it out. And then as Suzanne said, the darn corn kept growing back. And so we had to go in and keep getting a hoed out and the weeds and everything else. And so eventually it got to look like that. It's a five acre corn maze. This is Bill McPhee's uh, from his uh, piloting expertise that got us that image. But that's what it looked like. And a little bit later in the summer, uh, it really began to take shape, and then uh, this is from Tom Campbell, uh, but that's what it was during the show. Again, not a big deal in today's world, but back in the day, this was a pretty neat demonstration of what this GPS technology could do. And we had about 10,000 people go through that maze over the course of three days at the National Farm Progress Show. Um, and, and again, it's, it's partly a good example of sh using the technology but it's also a good example of the teamwork that was involved to pull it off. And this is one of those cases where people, they just came out of the woodworks to help on this. It was like Tom Sawyer painting the, the white fence. They would, I mean, we had everybody from professors to, to, to technicians, to graduate students, to friends of friends coming in. It was, it was just nothing I've ever experienced since. But this teamwork of coming together for a common cause and to do something that, you know, again, it's not a huge big deal. You know, we only drew 10,000 people over three days out of a total attendance of probably, you know, half a million or a quarter million. But it was a good example of coming together as a team uh, that, you know, some of us sort of, you know, maybe lament that we don't have quite as many opportunities to do that in today's world. So I said this technology became valuable for my research down the road. And, and when this character showed up in 2006, Jim Camerato, um, why did we start doing this field scale research? Uh, you said you were lazy and you didn't want to do small research. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I didn't think you were going to answer me, but... Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so thankfully we had the technology then to allow us to start doing what we call field scale research, uh, a lot of which is on farm. This is from one of our nitrogen trials down in Shelby County uh, with uh, uh, Ken Simpson, uh, Scott Gabbard, the local county educator, uh, Brandon Kessler, who's I, what a consultant, is high, a soils consultant for, for Ken. Um, but beginning in 2000, or 2007 probably, uh, when Jim arrived, we just started doing some of these field scale trials around the state. Um, this, is, this is one of our trials from this past year. Uh, this is a 150 acre 
hybrid by plant population trial down in Franklin County with Dan Chestnut. 150 acre trial uh, with six populations, two hybrids, replicated five or six times. Uh, each, uh, each plot was 16 rows wide by a mile in length. And this is our final pass that we're, that we're finishing up on that huge field. And so this field scale research clearly is enabled by the technologies. And if I, if I hadn't become a customer or experienced with that, I, I wouldn't have been able to, to move into this. Uh, and without it, you just can't do these kind of big field scale trials. Interestingly, the statistical quality of the data we generate from these trials is better than we can generate on small plots. It, it's been a revelation. The inclusion of these on-farm trials along with what we do on the Purdue farms uh, increases the size and geographic breadth of the entire database. And so back in the day when I first started, if we had maybe, what, Don, 10, 12 trials, we felt pretty good to generate some guidelines, would you say? In fact, 12 was probably on the high end. Well, uh, with these kinds of trials, uh, we can do way more than that and, and cover more of the state. And among other things, that makes the results more credible to our growers, partly because we're off the Purdue farms and partly because we simply have more and more trials to deal with. And then there's been this side benefit to doing this kind of on-farm research that we try to emphasize with our county educators. Uh, you know, we do have increased visibility for Purdue. We have increased visibility for Purdue agriculture, for Purdue extension, for Purdue agronomy in the, in the case of us, and for us individually. It builds our credibility and, and simply makes us more visible. Um, so now, so Jim now and I, we've done nearly 250 field scale nitrogen trials around the state since 2006. We've got 90 field scale population trials, 20 starter fertilizer trials in the last couple of years. Uh, and it's allowed, this technology has allowed us to do this that we never would have been able to do before. And we think we're generating data that, that's even better. All right, so what about tomorrow? Well, I don't have a clue. Uh, I didn't have a clue in 1982. I'm no better than I am today. So I don't know what's going to happen in the next 35 years. Uh, I know things will change. They always do. Uh, we don't like it sometimes, but times will change. Technologies will change. Mother Nature will change. And I do believe that the independent voice of extension will remain important for tomorrow's agriculture. Uh, somehow or other, extension has to remain viable. It has to be, remain in place. It has to remain independent because our growers need it, our clientele need that independent information. And I'm convinced that extension will always adapt and evolve just like it's always done in the past. And so tomorrow's extension isn't gonna look like today's and my replacement 20 years from now is not gonna look or do the same thing that I'm doing today, but that's okay. You know, that, that's sort of the circle of life if you wanna look at it that way. So I'll leave you with this one last piece of idealistic uh, uh, thing that I tend to believe in, but this has sort of been one of my mantras that I try to abide by, and, uh, and I thought Mark Twain probably said it best. So with that, Greg, that's all I got. Time, a couple questions, they tell me, so. <laughs> And I finished on time. You did. That never happened. I know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Any questions for Bob? Marv Swearingen wasn't on the program. I'm sorry? Marv Swearingen wasn't on the program. Which is why I finished early, you're saying? Yes, oh. That's why you finished on time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, John? Let me refute something you said. Oh. About some thinking, yeah. Bob they want you to push that fancy, push it for him, Larry, and keep it down, I think. I got it. You were talking about some of the things you've done over your, the last 35 years, and you said most of them aren't powerful. I want to take exception to that. I think what you have done in the last 35 years, the corn growers of this state and other states have been extremely powerful. Well, you have, you're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dr. Anderson. Bob, as I look at uh, other agribusinesses and they're getting into field trials and doing more work on their own, what is the impact of that uh, as you see on pension programs? That is a really good question. And, and, uh, and the answers depend on I guess on <laughs> your take on what they're doing. 
we all have, those of us in extension, we, we've, we have industry contacts that we do trust and that we respect and that we think they do good research. But I think most of us also have contacts with other aspects of industry that, well, let's just say they're not as reputable and they, they don't analyze data the way they should, they don't do experiments the way they ought. Um, and so that's, that's going to be the continuing challenge, I think, uh, and the continuing need for extension to not just remain in terms of education, but to also continue doing research. Because uh, without research to, um, to sort of back up or refute what may be coming out of some, as some parts of the industry, you know, we, we really don't have a leg to stand on. You know, the population work that you and I have done, Jim, uh, if you've seen any of those results, our, our results say that, that economic optimum populations are actually unbelievably low. Um, Dan here doesn't maybe believe me on some of these, they're so low, but we've got all these data to back it up. And so we're saying optimum population somewhere below 30,000 plants per acre. It is not uncommon for a seed salesman in particular to be promoting 35,000, 38,000 until more recently because now you and I both are hearing now and again uh, people saying, you know, from this company or that company saying, oh no, we're sort of in line with what Nielsen and Camberato say. That's pretty much what our data say too. Well. Did we persuade them? Or in fact, do they have the data now that suddenly says these populations are lower? You know, and we're talking maybe upwards of, uh, of uh, 15, 20 bucks an acre savings for farmers to use the, what we're recommending versus what some of the seed salesmen recommend. So did we impact them? I don't know. I hope we did. But, but so again, we need to have this, uh, you know, and Christian, I think a lot of the work that you've done on, on Neil Nix and, and, and all that stuff too, and, and without people like what Christian's doing on, on some of those, you know, we're, we'd just be inundated with, with claims and, and recommendations that we would not feel comfortable with, but we wouldn't have the data to back it up, so. Okay, time's up. All right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you.